accordingly. Okay, so uh, and Jonathan will be <laughs> get rid of it. <laughs> Just minus. Okay, so yeah, Jonathan will be telling us about the formation of uh, supermassive black holes and planets today. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be back in Pasadena and seeing uh, some old friends and colleagues. Uh, I think we're gradually coming out of this pandemic and it's nice to meet people in person again. So uh, yeah, I'd like to tell you uh, work we loosely frame within origins of science. What do we mean by that? Well, actually in, in, at Chalmers in Virginia, we've been uh, setting up these initiatives on cosmic origins. There's uh, every year we are hiring postdocs and uh, students uh, you can go to this website, cosmicorigins.space, to find out more about the various the programs we're running. Uh, there's a summer student program. A lot of these deadlines have just passed, but in future years, uh, please uh, point your students to, to, the, uh, to these uh, web pages. Um, we basically, oh, of course, we run conferences and workshops as well. The next big uh, conference uh, that I hope to see many of you at will be in Sweden in uh, June. Hundreds of abstracts are submitted and the SSC is busy uh, sifting through them. So Nick will be uh, there, so that's great. <laughs> okay, so as I'm wandering down the snowy streets of Sweden, I, I have to remind myself what's up there with my umbrella here, that we're actually part of the galaxy and complex of structure has emerged from the universe, including life. And of course, the origins of physical complexity are driven by gravity. Uh, but then for many systems approaching quasi-equilibrium, that, that gravitational collapse can be uh, resisted by either rotation, angular momentum, say for galaxies or star clusters, uh, for some kind of pressure, gas or radiation pressure in stars, or degeneracy pressure in uh, white dwarfs, neutron stars and, and planets. Uh, of course, if, if there's no uh, way, if, if gravity is too strong, we have the, the formation of black holes now imaged. Um, but these near equilibrium systems are relatively simple to understand and, and they're you know, reasonably well described by analytic uh, models. It's the formation process where we have complexity because things are actually not, not in equilibrium. So we have, again, gravity resisted by it could be gradients in cosmic ray pressure or magnetic field pressure. Or, uh, there could be turbulent motions of preventing collapse, as well as, as these other things. And then feedback, ground pressure from various stellar sources or AGN sources. So this uh, complexity means that um, you know, often we're not in balance. And you can see in the, in the image behind, many of the structures do not look like they are in a simple equilibrium. Now for chemical complexity, as you know, uh, as the universe has evolved uh, through, mostly through stellar evolution, this uh, periodic table has been building up and uh, within the elements that have been forged, about half of them are condensed into, at least half the mass has been condensed into dust grains of which act as surfaces to allow molecules to form. And of course, hundreds of molecules are now seen in space within mediated uh, via surface chemistry in cold molecular clouds, many uh, prebiotic species. And of course, if you crack open a meteorite, you'll find uh, all the amino acids that the life uses and many more. So we know that this can happen in interstellar and interplanetary uh, space. So because of these uh, vast ranges of scales, the complexity of the processes, we still have many open questions. I, I think these are still pretty much all open, like what sets the star formation rate in galaxies, why is star formation so clustered? You know, how do binary stars form and why do they form at the frequencies they do? The formation of massive stars, is it similar in nature to that of low mass stars or, or very different? And then today I'll, I'll talk about the very first stars and also supermassive black hole formation. Planet formation is not a settled theory, the great diversity of exoplanet systems, again, I'll touch on in the second part of my talk. So yeah, part one, formation of supermassive black holes in the early universe. This is a project we've, we've been working on on and off for 20 years, I would say. Uh, we started uh, trying to understand what the very what, what would happen in the very first dense structures, so-called mini halos. This is a, a simulation from uh, Tom Abel, uh, which shows roughly a million solar mass dark matter mini halo 
Uh, within that, there's a water of 10 to the 5 solar masses of mostly hydrogen and helium, uh, slowly contracting under weak cooling to form the first protostar. So but, you know, what happens next is, is uh, we'll come to. And then I, I want to tie this to, of course, the observations most large galaxies have a supermassive black hole, so something would attend to the five solar masses and greater. Um, you know, what is the connection here? Again, we now see these things, but we don't know where they, they come from. So the, the, the cosmic uh, stage is set here and, and we have a pretty good framework, but this, this from the, in the very earliest foundation, in some sense, is, of course, is furthest from us and darkest and mysterious still. And it's, of course, sets the foundation for galaxy formation and evolution. So if you don't have a firm foundation, maybe many other things are not quite the right. You know, what has been happening is we, we see high redshift uh, quasars uh, infer to have masses of order a billion times the mass of the sun. And so, you know, at redshift seven of 7.6, so that's only uh, less than 700 mega years after the Big Bang. That places constraints on what the initial seed mass should be. I mean, if, if their growth is Eddington limited, then you know you have only a certain amount of time to grow from a certain seed mass. That's what's shown in this uh, lower right panel here, arguing that the seed, at least for this particular case, may need to be quite massive, perhaps close to this 10 to the 5 solar mass scale. So potentially a need for seed objects for these, for these black holes that are themselves a supermassive. If you look locally at the supermassive black hole population centers of galaxies, well, the, the lowest mass exa example is of order 50,000 solar masses. So again, close to this 10 to the five uh, solar mass scale. There's, you know, there, there are claims of intermediate mass black holes, but you know, there, there are a handful of objects uh, some of these come from ultra-luminous X-ray sources, which could just be beamed, sort of 100 solar mass black holes. Uh, there's, there's not a huge number of these intermediate mass black hole sources from a number of different studies. And we'll come back to that, that point. But uh, it, it, could, it could mean, and, and many have argued, that maybe, again, this, uh, this uh, shows a need for a characteristic seed mass around 10 to the 5 solar mass at a supermassive scale. The other thing we can assess locally in the universe is the, you know, how many supermassive black holes are there? Well, roughly, if every third L star galaxy has a supermassive black hole, that's roughly the numbers. And that gives you a co-moving number density somewhere in the range, you know, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two per co-moving megaparsec. And that is a constraint on the models. And what happens in uh, cosmological simulations of galaxies? Well, here, here's an illustrious, typical example. So all the dark matter and baryonic physics and subgrid models for star formation and feedback. The supermassive black holes. Well, as soon as a dark matter halo reaches uh, seven times 10 to the 10 solar masses, it is given a seed. So it's a, a mass threshold on the halo mass that just, uh, you know, the seed appears out of nowhere. I mean, that, that, that is what is done in most of these uh, large volume simulations because we don't have a good theory for where these things have come from. We'll, we'll see in a moment uh, different options. Of course, a lot of semi-energy work has been done. You, if you vary the seed mass and so on, and what, what happens? But um, in, you know, there's basically a wide open playing field here of, of where do these seeds have come from? Now, the physics of supermassive black hole formation has been uh, you know, thought about for many, many decades. This is a review from Martin Rees back in 1978. I didn't read it until much later, but you know, he basically described, a, well, really two main routes. You could imagine a gas cloud fragmenting to a dense a star cluster, and then through collisions in a dense cluster, you could build up uh, perhaps a, a supermassive star or a, a very massive star first. And, maybe occasionally supermassive star, you, you, you would want to do this before these things explode as supernovae and much harder to merge neutron stars together than uh, you know, main sequence or giant stars. We, we, do, we do not see the conditions for, for such um, collisional growth in star clusters you know, locally, in, in lo even in the densest star systems. So th this mechanism is, I'd say is not particularly favored. Um, 
Also, you'd expect it to make many more intermediate mass black holes than supermassive ones. And again, generally, we don't see evidence for this, uh, say, in centers of globulars. There's no, no very strong evidence for, for lots of intermediate mass black holes being, having been formed. So most attention is focused on what is known as direct collapse, but should we just say collapse from somehow from a gas cloud to a supermassive object, a star, which you know, could either then, just as, as a result of nuclear fusion, run out of fuel and, and then efficiently collapse to a supermassive black hole, or um, perhaps pass the GR instability and then basically collapse to a black hole. So there's, there's a, a number of possibilities here, which we'll come to. Now, the very first objects, you might want to start there, and, and people have considered them. So population three stars that we mentioned. So these are dark matter mini halos, million solar mass objects. You have uh, a little bit of molecular hydrogen forming, catalyzed by trace amounts of free electrons in the gas phase. That sets the cooling, in fact, allows the, in the center of the mini halo, you can cool down to a few hundred degrees Kelvin. And uh, that sort of sets the structure before the protostar forms. It's, it, it's, it's contracting very slowly, actually almost in a singular isothermal sphere when it first forms a star. So it's not too far from the shoe solution that we're familiar with from classical studies of star formation. You, you know, with Chris McKee, we applied such models. This, this cartoon shows a, a disk fed, you know, fed by uh, a collapsing cork. You could even you probably have a dynamo first operating here and, and can generate fields so you can have outflows. Uh, you, you can follow the protostellar evolution of this, of this metal free star. And uh, it depends, it, its structure also depends on the accretion rate. Uh, these accretion rates are set by the microphysics of H2 cooling in this mini halo. So when we looked at this, st standard theory would suggest that the, the star would, would uh, contract to the main sequence by about 100 solar masses. At that point, the surface temperature is about 100,000 Kelvin. It's very hot. Most energy is coming out in the EUV. High, high ionizing photon uh, rate. Those ionizing photons can actually shut off accretion, both from the infall envelope, but also from the disk. You photo evaporate your disk. And that process we thought, uh, what well, we think, could, can, can limit accretion. Quite difficult to accrete to a few hundred solar mass star at the kind of accretion rate you expect from these mini halos. So this physics was also put into radiation hydro simulations uh, from Osagawa here. Actually, two independent groups in Japan were doing these kinds of simulations, taking mini halos from cosmological volumes, actually getting a mass function of these things, a peak at around 100 solar masses, maybe with a tail to 1,000 solar masses, but certainly not supermassive objects. So because of this work, the consensus emerged that pop three stars make so-called light seeds, not supermassive. And so it would actually be difficult to make the supermassive black holes. So most attention focused on so-called direct collapse, which is involved more massive metal free, but now uh, lime and burner irradiated halos. You've got to do that to prevent H2 molecules from forming, to so prevent the coolings, prevent the fragmentation. Uh, they're massive. Um, so ethereal temperatures close to 10 to the 4 Kelvin, atomically cooled halos. And uh, then they can have high accretion rates when they do collapse. And maybe those high accretion rates could potentially lead to supermassive objects if, if your accretion rates are approaching a solar mass per year. Although some of the, the details still need to be worked out. Now, to irradiate this thing, you need external sources. So actually, then any theory of this would have to predict the mass function of surrounding sources or even AGN activity. And of course, we don't yet really have a good theory for all of that. So it's somewhat uncertain. Still, groups have tried in cosmological volume settings to populate halos. How many atomic, how many of these direct collapse halos exist? They even follow them and make sure they're not tidally uh, disrupted in this Sachon study. The bottom, you know, the bottom line is you, you can find a candidate direct collapse halos, but they're rare. So the co-moving number densities that you're getting from such simulations are of these levels, something like 10 to the minus seven to make perhaps at most 10 to the minus four different uh, people's simulations. But remember, if I want to make all the supermassive black holes with, with this mechanism, I would struggle. 
And I, I don't think that's controversial. I've, I've talked to many direct collapse uh, simulators uh, that they seem to think, they, think they can happen, maybe could explain the high rates of quasars, but it would be difficult to have this make all the supermassive black holes. Now, I want to make all the supermassive black holes with a single mechanism and also come back to this point that there seems to be this, this dichotomy of mass scales from the stellar scale up to around 100 solar masses and then the supermassive scale. So I want to have uh, do everything in one go and explain this, uh, this lack of intermediate mass of sources. And I'm going to go back to the, the population three stars, the very first ones, which we call 3.1s. So let me explain what 3.1s are. So when we were working on pop three star formation with Chris McKee, we, we tried to introduce these definitions. Three point, population three means metal free, composition from the Big Bang. So essentially, I mean, the metallicity is, is, um, is below some critical value. The, the, met, the metallicity is not, whatever, whatever trace amounts you had in there are not affecting cooling or even stellar evolution. So, so essentially Big Bang nucleosynthetic composition. Now 3.1s are metal free, but they have not been affected by any feedback, so primarily radiation fields, from any other astrophysical source. So the halo has also not been affected. Whereas, so that's the, going to be the first object to form in some local region of the universe. Now, it itself, depending on what it is, will affect the surroundings by some radiation field. 3.2 is also metal free, but it has been irradiated essentially. So 3.2 could form over here. Any metal pollution would be more local and that could make the next you know, population two sources. So that's, that's what we mean by 3.1, 3.2, and then population two. So you see over here, something too far away from this feedback, it's isolated by some distance is also a 3.1. So that's, the def that's what we mean by 3.1. Now, why, why do I care about that? Well, in fact, when, when groups looked at the collapse of mini halos that have been irradiated, they find the electron fractions gone up to actually promote H2 and HD formation. There's, there's enhanced cooling, and you can actually fragment your, your mini halo. You can, you know, still quite massive stars, 10 solar masses was what uh, Olker Brahms group were inferring in their simulations. But you would perhaps form several stars or a small cluster within a mini halo. Whereas the population three sources tend to form single stars. It's very slow cooling uh, collapse into the center of the mini halo. And this then we think is key. You see, if I want to make a supermassive object, I basically have to do one thing. I have to stop this thing reaching the main sequence. I have to stop ionizing feedback. Now there is a proposed mechanism to do this, proposed first by uh, Katie Fries, Doug Spolia, and collaborators involving exotic physics, should we say, dark matter annihilation. So if dark, we don't know what dark matter is, not detected, but you know, it's in all everybody's cosmological simulation. The relic density is supposed to be set by an, some annihilation process, so weak annihilation process. So if it's some kind of wimp, should, should, should self-annihilate, makes uh, gamma rays and electron positron pairs and neutrinos, but two-thirds of the energy, it's not in neutrinos, it's can be trapped in the protostar. So you can actually put this into a stellar structure calculation, put it into MESA. That's what uh, Rind Ladala have done. And it's what we have done with a student in uh, Florida, um, unpublished work here, but they're showing you some tracks. But you can also look at the Rind Ladala study. And so we, remember with no WIMPs, no WIMP heating, you just go through normal protostellar evolution. You, 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 contract to the main sequence after you're older than your local Kelvin Helmholtz contraction time. But if you have WIMP annihilation as a power source in the star, you don't need to contract to the main sequence. You don't need to have be supported by nuclear fusion. And in fact, you know, depending on how much, if you can keep capturing dark matter, we think that's the rate limiting step, then there's a family of solutions where you can stay big, you know, something like a red giant, so if you could stay in that solution, you know, then your baryonic content of the mini halo would collapse to the center. As long as it doesn't fragment, it could all go to the center. And this is, this, you know, you need to keep your protostar large, cool photosphere, low ionizing luminosity, low feedback, efficient accretion, 
Now you have about 10 to the five solar masses in your mini halo. So that, that's, that's the supermassive scale. And you know, that, that's what we think is, is interesting in the connection to the seed. So this, this could form a supermassive star, maybe, maybe eventually runs out of, stops capturing enough dark matter, might contract the next sequence, fuse high, hydrogen for a million, few million years or something, then, then efficiently collapse to a black hole, or pass the GR instability, which is around 10 to the five solar masses, and also collapse to the black hole. So that, that is the scenario we, are, we are, want to investigate. POP 3.1s, the ones that are isolated, the only at this point in the universe do you have a single star forming co-located with the dark matter cusp, and maybe that's going to, uh, it can't, you know, the, the, the models show that the stellar evolution can be affected in a way that would allow uh, less feedback. So if, if we can be in that route, this is a way to get to supermassive scales. So we put this um, condition, we, we investigated this in a cosmological volume, 60 megaparsecs a cubed, where we can resolve mini halos and just look and see, uh, you know, basically do this, try and identify them. We have one parameter in the model, this isolation distance. Um, so that we're following, you know, the first one forms a redshift 40. Um, these are all the mini halos. So there's lots of mini halos. So the co-moving number density. This point here is the redshift zero co-moving number density of supermassive black holes we mentioned before. This is what we're aiming at. We, we could actually go higher, and then you could imagine merging black holes and coming lower again. But in fact, you know, we have mergers in here. Uh, we, we would need an isolation distance of about 100 kiloparsecs proper distance to, uh, you know, at that point, shut off new 3.1s if, if, this if this is the isolation distance requirement. So that's all finished by redshift 25. This is a co-moving, uh, you know, redshift 30, that's the ISO of 100 kiloparsecs is co-moving three megaparsecs. And uh, so we're done. So in this model, all the supermassive black holes are all in place by redshift 25. And after that, they, they're not forming anymore. So I always at this point ask, if anybody can tell me a reason that that's nuts, uh, please do. But you know that, that's the that's the model here. There, of course, there are many other predictions. Uh, we'll come to so we, we've now followed to redshift to zero. This is what Jasbia Singh is doing, and uh, he's in the Trieste Chalmers PhD program. Um, so this this shows down to redshift zero. This is what the mass thresholds. So what's used in illustrious is seven times ten to the ten solar mass condition. So their black holes appear at much lower redshifts, for example. And in fact, uh, what we would, you know, I was in a bar in Stockholm talking to Matt Hayes there, telling him about this. And we said, well, we should reobserve the ultra deep field and look for AGN by variability. And then Richard Ellis got excited about it as well. So we've been, for the last two HST cycles, asking, give us 30 orbits and let's go back to the ultra deep field, you know, taken by Richard Ellis and was it published in 2012. So it's, it's been about uh, 10 years roughly uh, you know, one, one or two years in the rest, in the rest frame of the source. It's, it's good for finding AGN by variability. Uh, so we, we were very excited by it, but unfortunately the HST TAC is not, was not in that bar in Stockholm and has so far not been convinced, but uh, we keep uh, trying. Uh, you know, because in, you know, for example, in, our, in, in this model where we form very high redshifts, you know, you'd have a lot of AGN still present you know, it's just in proportion to cosmological volume that you're probing. So that's what's shown in the left column, the sources. Um, whereas again, in this mass threshold based models, they'd all be appearing at much lower in shifts. So, but of course you, you need to do uh, an estimate of the luminosity functions and the duty cycle, that's all quite complicated. We just won't have any constraint. And, and James Webb, of course, will look now in these fields, but having complementary, uh, you know, match filter variability estimates would, would be the best. To, to, uh, we still think it's worth the doing. So uh, 30 orbits, please. Uh, you know, you can predict uh, the occupation fraction. So redshift six, for example, um, perhaps 20 or 30% of the most massive halos are seeded in our mechanism. And we can follow that down to lower redshifts. One, one key thing is the clustering. I, I won't go through these little movies, but because of this isolation 
distance criterion, our seeds are very spread out. So their angular clustering is quite uh, low compared to if you did a mass threshold model, that's sort of the green versus the gray symbols here. And that, that can be done in angular clustering on the, if you had a big enough patch or locally. So I would like a complete census of all the supermassive black holes locally, or maybe I just do the work with the bulges and uh, I can tr try and compare to this you know, 3D space a clustering model. That's what's just shown uh, here. And of course, you know, we have relatively low rates of um, mergers compared to many other models of supermassive like a binary statistics will be lower. Um, you know, we have some mergers happening, uh, but they're occurring at a low rate. Now there is this uh, low frequency signal uh, result from nanograph. So we haven't done a quantitative maps yet, but th these models will produce some line on here and this needs to be done by somebody uh, soon. Now, what uh, could set this, uh, I just pull this isolation, I, I, I varied the ISO, you know, I have one parameter, I varied it to give me the right number density. But let's say I did have a supermassive star at some phase, 100,000 solar mass star, which reached something like the main sequence, so it would have a temperature around 100,000 degrees Kelvin. You can easily work out its ionizing output. So a normal O star is something like 10 to the 49. Uh, EUV photons per second. This would be something like 10 to the 53. Now, the stronger in sphere in the intergalactic medium at redshift 30 is, uh, you know, about 60 kiloparsecs. So, you know, it's in the ballpark. In fact, you can make these kinds of models with uh, stronger models for the, for the um, you know, for the ISO, and you can get close here. So, there are, there, are, there are subtleties. It's probably R type expansion. You may not have time to fill the strong sphere. It's, prob it's probably actually the FUV field in front that's dissociating, but still, it's an interesting uh, scale here. We, you know, we also don't want to reionize the universe uh, too early, of course. But still, the physical models, uh, the simplest physical model you can come up with is, is um, the scale is interesting. So that's uh, a summary of this first part. Uh, maybe we need massive seeds. Um, there's a certain co-moving number density of them. If you want to make them with a single mechanism, direct collapse on its own, would, I'd say struggles. So we proposed a single mechanism based on somewhat exotic physics, a dark matter annihilation, heating in the very first population 3.1 protostars to change the story of protostellar evolution and bifurcate so with this route, get up to the supermassive scale and make all the seeds in one and go, but very early. And it makes a lot of uh, predictions. We're a small group working on this. We need help. So we talk to somebody about the, the, you know, anything where you can have an idea here to help us test this is very interesting for us. So now let's go to um, the other end of the scale and, and the planet formation. So I'd like to tell you about what we call inside-out planet formation and particularly the super-Earth, uh, the origin of the super-Earths. This is something we started in Florida with Surab Chatterjee. It's actually after I was visiting LA at UCLA for a talk, uh, we, we got interested in this idea and then it's, it's sort of ballooned with a, a bigger team of people. As you probably know, planet formation, protoplanetary disks is, are undergoing a revolution. We can resolve them with ALMA. Uh, but uh, what I tell my ALMA colleagues is, you know, this is not good enough. Uh, this is 5 AU and the nearest systems are in 100 parsecs because a lot of the systems we see are right in inside 1 AU around the host star, seen by radial velocities, but also most systems found by uh, transits. So transits, as you know, are the shadow cast. as the, the planet goes in front of the host to star. Now, as a theorist, I never thought I'd make transit observations, but here I was going to the, the summer AAS meeting in uh, Alaska back in 2012. Fortunately, the summer meeting, this is Ketchikan. This is famous for being the, the bridge to nowhere, if they build a bridge to link this aside here. And I was reading the BBC news and said, oh, the, the transit of Venus is uh, happening right now. So I, I rushed outside with my camera and stared at the sun clicking away. And 
half blinded myself. Uh, I was trying to capture the, the transit of Venus. Didn't, didn't succeed in this one. But then uh, yeah, a few minutes later, some clouds came over. And if you look closely, this, this tiny little dot here is in fact uh, Venus. So that's the transits. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a transit observer of sorts. It's not a sunspot, it's real. Okay, but of course, Kepler has found thousands of planets at around the same time here. This was showing the discoveries, you know, which have three uh, transits uh, uh, growing in time around 2012. Now, uh, what is it, four or 5,000 systems. This, this is the extent of my Swedish, I'm afraid. So the superiorda here, this big uh, cluster of planets, Sma, Neptune, Liska, uh, Planeta, uh, and the Varma, Jupiter, Planeta up here, and the Kala, uh, Jupiter, Planeta. It's very useful in the supermarket when I'm on trying to order things. But anyway, this is, uh, this is the landscape of exoplanets. And in fact, of course, because of the detection biases, you can uh, try and take that out here. This is what Mulders has done. These super Earths are very common, very common systems. The, the, the hot Jupiters are not so common. These, these super Earths, these are in typically multi-systems. Uh, they've been called systems with tightly packed inner planets, STIPs. And back in like the, the, the conference we do every three years, so this is back in 2013, I was learning about these uh, dips from Darren Ragazine. This is a transcription of his slide. Uh, a few planets per system, sizes of a few Earth radii, you know, similar sizes as, as you go out, perhaps the outer ones are slightly bigger, periods, uh, a few tens of days maybe. Um, tightly packed, so the, the period ratios are a few, separations of a few, few tens of neutral hill radii. But of course, these are old systems that Kepler looked at so that they're stable. Mostly non-resonant period ratios. So they're not typically in low water mean motion resonances. And of course, they're low dispersion and inclinations. When you can measure a mass through rate of velocity or TTV, the transit timing variation, you, you, can, you can get a density estimate because, because, of course, the transit just gives you the size relative to the host star. So you, when, when you can measure the mass and you get a density, you see there's a wide dispersion densities. So, so quite a few of them have, have accreted, we think, a little bit of hydrogen helium, change the size a lot, but not change the mass. So a few percent by mass of hydrogen helium is inferred. Very common. It used to be, I used to put 30% here, uh, the, the, talking to... to uh, Zinc, a uh, more recent study here. This could be more than 50% of low mass stars have a uh, you know, host of STIP. So they could be the most common kind of planet you know, anywhere in the galaxy. This is um, the fancy NASA press release about uh, when the Pettigura study inferred that one in 10 sun like stars. You know, has a habitable super Earth, you know, typically in these are stip systems. This one has two. So, how do they form? I mean, this planet formation standard theory is such you form in the, in the outer disk somehow, but we actually don't really know how. Core accretion, so building up from solids rather than direct, you know, gravitational instability is, is what's the context for these super Earths, but there's still no theory for can predict how these planetary cores emerge and why. You know, there's a huge range of scales that you have to grow from dust up to uh, even planetesimals. And there's some barriers to that growth, famous barriers, the meter size barriers, basically two barriers. As you, as you, these pebbles, these dust grains grow into pebbles, they start feeling gas drag. So they don't hang around too much in a particular location of a gas disk. And also there's a collisional barrier. So it's with a fragmentation and bouncing barrier once they get too big because of their relative speed. So that's why the streaming instability has been, so much work has been done to collectively uh, gather these pebbles together and, and collapse to form kilometer sized objects. Anyway, somehow let's say you could form a planetary core, then sure it can inter interact with the gas disk and undergo migration, exchange angular momentum to, 
type one migration when it's a relatively low mass and the shallow uh, gaps. Type two yes, it grows, it's, it's more massive planet, opens up a deeper gap, but still tend to migrate inward. So now on a, on a slower viscous time. Well, so attempts were made to, put, to reproduce the steps by this mechanism. You would in, insert planets in the outer disk and see how they, they, they uh, evolve. Um, and Neil and Nelson tried to do this. They said it's quite difficult here to very, it's ex extremely difficult for these oligarchic tidal migration models. This is figure one in their paper. I don't know what it's on about, but it's, uh, you know, it's, obviously they were having some difficulties uh, here. You know, th these are the orbits that were not concentrated enough. They, they couldn't get enough concentration to the, the scale of where the steps are. Now, more recent work from, this is from the Lund uh, group, they could occasionally get a super earth you see to, to this, this uh, pink one could migrate inwards see the, the problem is you don't want it to to grow too much and accrete too much gas and become a hot it could become a cold to jupiter because then it it sort of stalls its migration that's what happened to these guys here so you know occasionally you can make one but um when you do when you do migrate in multiple systems you, you actually tend to expect them to be trapped in, in these low order mean motion resonances, which are not seen. So then you have to move them out of resonance again. So other mechanisms are invoked. Uh, some of them are done here. Well, um, so at UCLA, uh, Brad Hansen just said perhaps uh, the practical form in situ. So perhaps this is all, you know, plant formation is wrong and, and, you know, perhaps they just, the plants sort of grow in situ. So the, they didn't have a fully developed model. This is what uh, they had here. They just had an end body, collisional end body simulation with a bunch of protoplanets, actually 50 Earth masses inside one AU, which is put in. In fact, they started with a six Earth mass core at the outer region. They evolved this for 10 mega years and then they got a, a fairly flat distribution um, and you know, said maybe this looks like some steps of systems. So that's fine, but you know this was criticized by Ogihara. If you put in gas here, you actually get different architectures out. So they, you know, they got, didn't get a, a very, this is the observed quite flat mass versus orbital radius uh, results of the scene. But, but in such a simulation, they, they were finding a quite rapid a decrease in mass with radius. Okay, so this is what we propose inside our planet formation. It's an in situ model. But it forms the planets one at a time. So stage one is uh, pebble drift. So we embrace the meter size barrier, gas drag. We're going to grow the dust grains to centimeter size pebbles, millimeter size pebbles. They, they come in by gas drag, we'll explain in a second. They stop at a certain location. That location, <clears throat> it, we identify as the dead zone in a boundary. <clears throat> now, what is a dead zone? Well, it, the ionization level is too low to have effective coupling of the magnetic field. With the shearing disk here. Whereas when you have enough ionization, still a trace amount in this red zone, then you know this, the shearing disk can couple to the magnetic field, the, the magneto rotation and stability starts to operate. The viscosity in the disk rises by orders of magnitude. And imagine a steady accretion rate disk here. If at some point your viscosity increases a lot, your disk drains away. So you actually your, your, your density goes down, your surface density goes down, in fact, your pressure goes down because of this. So there's a local pressure maximum at the dead zone in a boundary. The reason for pebble drift is because they feel a headwind. That's because the gas is orbiting slightly subkeplerian because it's got, it's got a pressure gradient generally outwards. If there's no pressure gradient, then the gas is orbiting keplerian. There's no headwind here. So this is known as a pressure trap for solids. So the pebbles are just keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. I, I don't want them to meet the streaming instability or anything else so they just keep coming and it, at some point uh, you know they, they may dominate the mass local mass surface density in this ring and somehow a planet forms in fact that's probably what we said in the, the original paper so, yeah, somehow planet forms it could involve a streaming instability or gravitational collapse of this ring but in fact we don't really care as long as most of the mass goes into this uh, single planet you know, and, and collects there. What we care about is what stops the growth. It's growing by pebble accretion. And we identify that as isolation due to shallow gap opening. As you open a gap, 
your density is going to go down, your ionization fraction will rise, the MRI will spread, the dead zone will retreat, the pressure maximum will retreat, the pebble ring, the pebbles keep coming, new pebble ring forms, and the process repeats. So that, that's the idea of inside out planet formation. Paper one uh, presented that uh, in various analytic estimates. You know, our, our disk is based on a Shakura Sanaya for a disk model. We have to fix an accretion rate. So we use Claudio Manara's observations of accretion rates around transition disks. I mean, this, this picture screams transition disk. Uh, so there's a wide dispersion, but it, it's typically around 10 to minus nine solar masses per year. So that sets our disk structure. Um, the very first planet is special here because it, it, its location you see is set by where, where is the dead zone in a boundary. That, that is actually set when you thermally ionize sodium and potassium at around 1200 Kelvin. And that is predicted uh, in the Shakura Sanaya model, you know, where do you reach 1200 Kelvin? So you can predict where the planet is going to be, the first one. And there's a, you know, that, that we can compare to the data we did in paper two here. Then Xiao Hu was a student in Florida. He started working, you know, so Zhao Wanzhou joined, and we did some simulations of gap opening. When you start having a planet here, you know, what mass do you need to be to, um, to, open, to, to move the pressure maximum? Does the, is the planet going to migrate? We also studied that. It's actually a migration trap here, so the planet shouldn't move. And then we built a more global model for how the, the pebbles are, you know, are being supplied here. The accretion rate is 10 to the minus nine solar masses a year. So the, the, the solid supply rate in the most efficient case is something like 10 to the minus 11 solar masses per year. So that could set the planet formation time scale. Then with Subu Mahanti, who, you know, who is an expert in looking at the structure of uh, dead zones and boundaries. So, and his student, Maria Yankovic, we did a few papers on the structure of these inner disks to basically try and probe in more detail here. You know, is it really, Thermal ionization of potassium that sets the, 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 the location here. Uh, we've done some end body work with uh, Simon Portuguese Vard and Maxwell Kai, looking at uh, coagulation of, of planets and a, a model of the chemical evolution of the disk has, has just been submitted by a master's student, Chandas Arturo uh, Savalas Soto. So there's lots of different physics in, involved here, but you know, here are some of the key features. This, this location, where do you? You reach 1200 Kelvin, that's when you thermally ionize potassium. That gives you enough ionization to activate the MRI. In this complicated equation, it's just from the Shakura Sinai of Alpha Disk model. So, this R1200 is the location, the 0.2 AU around a one solar mass star when it has an accretion rate 10 to minus nine solar masses per year with a viscosity parameter 10 to minus four, which is roughly what is seen in numerical simulations of dead zone regions. So the, the scale is about right for the location of the uh, observed the SIPs. This is uh, just showing the about 600 uh, of these innermost planets that are where they are in radius. Um, but also this is the, how the mass would scale. And so there are predictions which uh, seem to match here. This was done in, in paper two of the paper. Now, what is the mass scale? So, the, the mass scale for shallow gap opening to move the pressure maximum away from the planet, again, can simply be evaluated here, but there's a, a fudge factor here, which we've calibrated against simulations. Uh, it's a few Earth masses. Now, it does depend a little bit on the viscosity here, uh, but it's, you know, some of these things are quite weak. So, in fact, this, remember, it's gap opening that sets the mass scale. In fact, this, this gap opening mass doesn't vary much with radius. In fact, this is why we have a fairly flat distribution of masses with radius in this uh, theory. This can help explain the so-called peas in a pod, why are the planets also similar in the mass. This is, um, there are RB studies of STIPs, so M sine i is measured. And uh, assuming sine i is the same, you know, you, you've got <clears throat> fairly flat mass versus radius which we can uh, try and match to here. I guess one of the main predictions is these things should be rocky. They're not, you know, if, if, you, if you form in the outer disk, they'd be very icy and quite low density. These have iron rocky cores. Now they could, could get a bit of hydrogen helium, which can complicate things, but this, you know, Fulton uh, gap here, 
this, in, this, this side of the gap are the ones that are evaporated and reveal the composition. So this has been, um, let me advance to the next slide. This has been modeled by Rogers and Owen. They've got a, a modeling of the, of the evaporation process going on. They try and infer what the original, the initial composition of the planets are accounting for evaporation. They find a very narrow distribution, iron rich uh, is inferred in their model. Now, maybe there's some uncertainties here, but I think they've done as best they can. So certainly if you just directly measure the densities of the, of the, the Vulcan ones, the, the innermost ones, they are dense. So this to me is uh, nice, you know, tidal migration people will struggle with uh, this uh, kind of dense, these kind of compositions. Now, should they accrete a little bit of hydrogen helium? In, in, this, in, in inside a planet formation, the planet is forming in a gas disk. We've got the gas disk around. So you put a few Earth mass core, what happens? Um, well, other groups have looked at this as well. Eve Lee has looked at this. Uh, this is using the, the burn model, uh, Mordacini's model for planetary accretion. You put in a, a core at 1200 Kelvin in the inner disk. So if you put in, a, I don't know, three Earth mass core here, Within a, a few hundred thousand years, it's accreted perhaps one, two percent of an Earth mass. So it's quite natural to have a, a primordial hydrogen helium uh, atmosphere in these models. And, and then later, you know, the close in ones could be evaporated. Okay, well, why does the why does it happen at 10 to the minus nine? Well, we're looking at that. This is not yet published, but um, we're basic, remember, this is the pressure trap at the dead zone inner boundary. What it's fighting against is, is just the radial drift of, of gas in the accretion disk. So if the accretion rate's too high or some other conditions are not met, um, you won't be trapped here. And th this places a condition on uh, the size of the pebbles, uh, but also the, the accretion rates. So the evolution here is from high accretion rates generally down to low accretion rates. At high accretion rates, you need to be a bigger pebble to be trapped at this inner dead zone inner boundary. So we think it's some combination of this dropping as the accretion rate drops and pebbles growing that uh, leads to this typical uh, scale here. You see, we, we cannot have inside our planet formation start at accretion rates of 10 to minus seven, because then the planet would be too far out and uh, much too uh, big. So we need the process to be start operating around 10 to minus nine here. Uh, one of the summer students last year, we, you know, we put this into Athena++ with MHD, with particles. Xiao Hu has you know, really led this, but the summer student was uh, analyzing the data. And uh, you know, we can characterize the turbulence in this dead zone in a boundary region, measure alpha, for example, measure the, the amount of fluctuations. We can look at particle trapping conditions. So that's sort of work that's ongoing. This is the vertical uh, structure of the pebble uh, ring here. And uh, I know I'm out of time, I guess. Let me see, so I'll, I'll stop now. But you know, this is the result from the end body simulations. Do, do these things oligarchically coagulate into a ring? There, there are still some issues here. So we, we actually need, I think, to include all of the gas migration talks because in this study with Maxwell Kai, uh, we were finding quite massive secondaries that still left over, which is, not, which is inconsistent with the data. So, you know, inside, we have a few things we have to overcome still, but we're very encouraged by the model because it, we, you know, we think it can naturally explain the uh, inner locations, the compositions of the planets and the various other things. So the last thing is just the, here's another prediction. We, we've run the chemistry, done the protoplanetary disk chemical model, including pebble drift, which is uh, not commonly done, but is, is important. And I guess the main thing is because of, of rapid pebble adrift, we're, we're delivering a lot of water ice. So we have very low C to O ratio in the gas in the inner region in, in our models. And that would be, you know, if we could measure the, that C to O ratio in the atmospheres of these super Earths, we would predict it's very low. Of course, the bulk composition is very uh, rocky. Okay, I will better summarize here. Um, So let me just jump to my summary of inside our planet formation. The stips, super Earths are very common. 
it's debated whether they form uh, in the outer disk and migrate in tidal migration models or in situ. Most people are, are on the migration model side. Uh, we propose an in situ model that's sort of from the, the ground up from the, the dust grains. Dust grains are at the pebbles, trapped at the dead zone in a boundary. Shallow gap opening sets the mass. Process uh, repeats. Predictions of, um, well, one thing, we don't have to solve the meter size barrier, so that's good. Uh, we naturally create fewer Earth mass planets and tightly packed orbits. You know, they wouldn't be in resonance because the location is set by where the dead zone retreats to. Um, there are particular scalings of the innermost planet, the Vulcan planets, very iron, uh, ro you know, rocky iron composition of the core, but you can get a little bit of hydrogen helium. Now, why does this not happen everywhere? Well, how do you stop it? And like the solar system, why didn't it happen here? So you could shut off the pebble supply by an outer trap. So, you know, I don't think that the, the pressure bumps you get with the passage jumps are that, that strong. So I don't favor this. You know, I don't want to just put in a planet to do it because that doesn't explain where the planet came from. So I could either suppress the MRI, sorry, maintain the MRI, kill the dead zone. I could kill the dead zone by extra radioactivity. So maybe, you know, maybe the solar system had a rate more radioactivity. Some people have discussed such scenarios. Kill the dead zone is one way to stop this. Or a Hall effect. So the Hall effect suppression of the MRI is, a, is a, something I've learned about a little bit, but if the large scale magnetic field is one way in a disk compared to the other way, if it's one way you suppress the MRI, the other you, you know, the MRI can happen, and this could you know, this actually very nicely explains maybe why binaries are fifty percent systems, but could also explain potentially explain uh, why stips are around roughly half of uh, low mass systems. So that's my favorite uh, thought there. And statistics, if, if it ends up being fifty fifty, then this full effect suppression of the MRI is probably uh, what is going on. And the future is bright. This is Ariel mission, a European mission. Uh, but the James Webb will also, be, of course, be measuring compositions in a number of systems. So I think we can uh, make progress here. Thank you. Okay. Ooh, and here's the full summary. Sorry. Black holes as well. Any questions? Oh, no, no. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll try to Liam's question. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. That was great. I've got a question about the first half of your talk. So, can you say a bit about primordial black holes as a supermassive black hole seed? Do you think there's a strong theoretical basis for that scenario? Um, and do you know much about the status of sort of mass ranges that would be relevant as seeds, whether or not those have been constrained? I know very little, I'm afraid, of primordial uh, black holes of, of, of uh, you know, what, uh, what, what uh, physics is, is supposed to control such a formation of such objects. Um, you know, if you, if you make, there are constraints on, you know, people, I, I've met them in the, in the context of people on the dark matter to be primordial black holes, for example. Right. And there, there are constraints, of course, on, what mass they can be from you know, microlensing and so on. Um, but in terms of, uh, there's probably quite a range of theories out there, which I'm, I'm afraid I'm no, no expert. Um, the, the mechanism we presented involves, everything is standard. The only thing, the new physics we, we need, we need dark matter uh, to self-annihilate. We actually also need um, dark matter to be captured efficiently. So we, we care about the sort of, um, you know, the, the cross section of interaction dark matter scattering cross sections, because that's the way that they can lose energy and, and settle into stars. So those are the two pieces of, of I'd say, new physics that we, uh, through this study, constrain. If we want all the supermassive black holes produced by this mechanism, there are some constraints on, on that physics. Thanks. Any other questions? Sure. Um, so if, if you were to maybe did this, but if you were to put your um, 
change the prescription for, for maybe one whole season of biological simulation and run that to be a zero. Um, what what change would you see in the pattern distribution? So we have this parameter D ISO. Um, as we bring it down, we have many more seeds. So we, we would start having, uh, you know, this, this yellow line here, orange line is uh, the ISO 50 kiloparsecs proper. So it uh, nominally over predicts by, you know, factor of 10 or so the, the co moving uh, number density, but, you know, it could be hidden black holes. We, we do have the mergers in here as well. So we're, you can, this, this is hardly decreases by mergers because they, they are still quite separated. Um, so that's, you know, I, I guess the, the clustering would slightly change, but, but still, this is, um, this is still a relatively distributed population, even though we've got many more systems. So really, the, the co-moving number density is, is uh, what is changing, and um, also, the, I suppose, the merger rate, although it's low, it changes a lot as we go, as we bring the ISO down. So the gravitational wave uh, signals, the statistics of, of dual AGN would change I think, quite dramatically. Right. Any other question from online? Right. Yeah. The explain again the link is that the between the background of the reductivity of the system and the, and the efficiency of the whole effect. Do you assume that you get a reversal in battery system? My understanding of the of this, well, I, I, I can't say I have a very deep understanding of it. I've just seen what I've, I've read, mostly Mark Wardle's uh, uh, work uh, in the context of um, whether you have small disks or large disks, in fact. Um, but the MRI can be suppressed by a number of things. And one of them is if the large scale field is is uh, you know is dynamically strong and um, but if it's if it's one way or the if the, if the large scale field is pointing one way or the other I know that if the sign changes and, and the MRI is either enhanced up to echo you know, we amplify to echo petition um, or it's it's suppressed so I, ca I can't say more, much more than that I'm afraid we'll have to you know. Go into the look at look at Mark Wardle's papers and, and see that. But, uh, okay, I just thought you, you mentioned multiplicity alongside. Uh, well, I mean, why why half of this roughly half of systems are binaries? Uh, I think it's also, and this is the context Mark Wardle has uh, has discussed this. Um, you. If you, if, if you, yeah, you, you, obviously on, on average, half the time the field will be one way or the other. So, um, it's a way to bifurcate, right? So, you can have half the systems do one thing and half the other. So, half the systems could have very small disks, which are unlikely to form, a, you know, fragment and form a binary system. I think that's, that's my favorite explanation of why roughly half the system single stars. Compared to binaries. Now, um, I'd actually have to, I suppose I should check if it's the right way for, you know, but, I, you know, I, if so do the single stars are the ones which are also going to have this uh, still have a pressure trap. I better check that. Actually, it's a good point. <laughs> But you know that that's not that's, that's this explanation of binary statistics is, is, is not yet a settled thing. So that's just a proposal. And so, what is interesting in the statistics of the uh, protoplanetary disk is many systems. You know they do have many systems that are quite compact. All the pretty images you see from the D sharp or the, the Maps project, for example, are, are the large disk systems, which are relatively rare, as was discussed at the conference last week. Um, was eighty percent of so are more compact to disk systems. And I don't see any other brief uh, and online. So uh, let's thank Jonathan again. Thank you.